Northampton and to our lovely senior center uh, for today's uh, event uh, entitled Creating New Housing Opportunities in Northampton. And I want to thank you all for coming today to participate in this important community discussion about, uh, about talking about and potentially creating new housing opportunities um, in Northampton. Uh, before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge um, some fellow elected officials uh, that are here today. Um, uh, Ward 4 City Councilor Pamela Schwartz, though I know she's also wearing a housing hat today, is here. Uh, she just came in. Um, Ward 7 City Councilor uh, Jean Tacey is here with us today, who's in the back of the room. Uh, and then I wanted to also uh, recognize uh, Diana Zinal, who is representing uh, State Representative Peter Cocott's office. So thank you for being here as well. Um, I also want to thank the Northampton Housing Partnership, uh, which uh, helped put together this event, brought us all here together today, um, as well as working with uh, Peg Keller of my staff um, and the Northampton Office of Sustainability, uh, Planning and Sustainability uh, for putting this together. <laughs> Today's gathering was funded in part by a small grant from the Commonwealth's Department of Housing and Community Development. Now, while it covered some of the expenses of the Cecil Group and Ken uh, Buckland, who helped assemble the panel today, um, didn't cover all of them. So in, in, in lieu of being able to pay our guest experts that are here today, uh, we, we, we wanted to give them a small token of our appreciation. So uh, Peg is going to give each of you a, um, a medallion, uh, which is... Uh, the, uh, which were created during the Northampton's 350th anniversary. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely medallion that has our city seal on it. Um, now our city seal and motto, our motto actually, um, is, is caring education and justice. Uh, caritas educatio justitia. Uh, and so caring education justice. Three themes which I think exemplify uh, the values of Northampton <coughs> and in part exemplify this conversation, this community conversation, about providing housing opportunities for all members of our community. Uh, again, our goal in Northampton, we've been a leader in creating housing opportunities, and our goal continues to be to provide opportunities to current and future residents at a range of incomes uh, to keep Northampton uh, healthy and welcoming to all. So again, I want to thank you all for being here today. It's my pleasure to come and welcome you, and I'll now turn it over to uh, the rest of the folks to run the program. Thank you. being here today and thanks especially to our esteemed panel of experts. Um, they have prepared for weeks for this and then we went on a walking tour for earlier today of some of the sites that they're going to be looking at. So they've been here for a good portion of today so I thank you for your time as you've done that. For those of you who don't know since this is falling off, uh, I'm Lynn Wallace. I'm chair of the housing partnership for the city of Northampton and for those of you who don't know about the housing partnership, um, it's a board of volunteers that's been in existence since 1991. Uh, we are charged by city ordinance with identifying and addressing the city's housing needs, particularly for housing um, for low and moderate income folks. We are also assisting the city with efforts to preserve existing affordable housing stock and supporting initiatives to create new housing opportunities. Current members of our partnership, who some of you are here, if you could stand so that we could acknowledge you. Audrey Easter is our vice chair. Richard Abuza. <laughs> Martha Applesberg. Not here. Um, Alex Akers. Jen Derringer. <laughs> That's it, come on. Were you really standing up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 I can see her. I can see her. <laughs> Tony Hofstadt in the back, Gordon Shaw, who I don't think is here, um, and Rachel Taylor Dower in the back as well. And we absolutely could not do our work without our staff person, Peg Keller, who needs to stand up again. Uh, she has been working long and hard staffing our committee and pulling this. Uh, panel together, so we thank you, Peg. 
Um, and we are very happy, the housing partnership is very happy to be sponsoring this with Wayne. Wayne will be coming up next and I'm sure he will tell you that this is a follow-up to a downtown development forum that we had last April. Um, and the purpose of today's forum was specifically towards housing, which the downtown developers forum wasn't specifically about housing. But we want to start thinking creatively about ways to increase the production in Northampton, especially around affordable housing. Um, we are known as a community that cares about affordable housing, and we have been able to maintain our 10% threshold. We're about 11.3% now. But there's always more work to be done, and there's always ways in which that we can better that uh, housing stock that we have. The idea for this forum came out of um, a housing assessment and strategic plan that the partnership completed in July of 2011. And we looked at uh, housing resources, resources for the city and how we could chart our future um, in addressing some of the needs that came out of the demographics. <coughs> the plan itself emphasized the convergence of demographic and housing trends, increase, which are the increasing numbers of households, albeit they are smaller households, lower incomes, increasing poverty, rising prices, stagnant or decreased housing production, a declining supply of rental units, difficulty in obtaining financing for both homeowners and developers, large upfront cash requirements for both homeowners and renters, all of which were pointing to a growing affordability gap. The gap is reinforced by census data that indicated 3,000 households, or about one quarter of all Northampton households, were living in housing that was beyond their means and unaffordable by the common definition of spending more than 30% of your income on your housing needs. If such demographic and housing trends are left to evolve unchecked, Northampton could lose its ground as a community in which all people across all ranges of economic and income stratas are able to call home. The housing partnership is working hard to let this not happen, and we are having these community events and educating the community and we are going to have two additional sessions. The next coming up on November 4th, intended to be a more targeted uh, local development conversation. So as we go through big picture, what other communities have done conversations tonight from our experts, there's something that tickles your fancy or stimulates you to thinking, come to the November 4th session because we'll be rolling up our sleeves and saying, how can we make these things happen? And then we will also have one uh, early next year, probably in the spring, and we're going to celebrate creative projects that are already in existence or that are, are about to happen in the Valley. So look forward to working with many of you on these upcoming sessions, and I'm going to have Wayne come up, introduce the panel, and get us started. Just very quickly, I, I think the message has come clearly from the planning board, the housing partnership, the mayor, and city council that we're really interested in more housing, market rate housing and affordable housing within walking distance of downtown, within walking distance of Florence and Leeds, within our old vibrant commercial neighborhoods. Um, and so we had a series of events which you've heard about of how do we send a message out that we want to protect these neighborhoods, we want to make them stronger, but we also want to make sure that the new housing we get in town is within those areas. And so this panel is part of that effort to figure out you know, how can we without you know, without harming neighborhoods, how can we make them more vibrant and having more people live there? Um, the only other event I want to add as well is towards that end, the other activity going on is we've had a narrow lot architecture design competition where we invited architects to submit for a plan for a small lot the city owns in Florence, one Garfield Avenue, but part of that effort was also about coming up with designs that would work in other neighborhoods as well. Um, and that we've received 32 submittals, that competition is going to be held, the, uh, the event is going to be the AP Gallery, November 1st to the 8th, and so it's a great opportunity to come and, and get those ideas as well. Um, with that, I'll introduce Ken Buckland from Cecil Group and let him introduce the rest of the panel. Thanks. Thank you very much, Wayne. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice to see you all here. Uh, today, uh, on our agenda, we have a number of different I ideas we're trying to get across. Overall, our concept is we want to educate and inform, we want to get a little bit of excitement going, and we want, to, and we want people to actually implement some of the ideas that, that we're, 
we're bringing forward. We've actually looked at a couple pieces of property within the city. We'll talk about them and, and uh, give you an idea about our perspective on it. Maybe you can, you can give us a little feedback as, as well in terms of a, a discussion about what's going on. Um, does that look like me? Uh, that, that's a, a, a picture a, a few years ago, but uh, it's a uh, before, it was, it was after I had done the Sustainable Northampton Master Plan. Dropped up that first one and, uh, about six years ago when it failed me. Um, I've also done a, uh, a design guidelines handbook for 40B uh, projects for the, uh, the, the uh, subsidized agencies for the, for the state uh, through the work of Connie Kruger and, and the MHP that, that helped in, in that process that, that, that came along. Uh, overall, the Cecil Group is a planning and design firm. We work on a lot of different project types. Our, our focus nowadays is the idea that where, what is happening in these, in these small, small urban centers that have transit opportunities in them and how it can, because that is, seems to be the, the place where things are growing and changing. And so we look at, at uh, redevelopment of, of, uh, of uh, sites and infill development that comes along with that. And we'll be providing some of that, uh, the ideas that our designers have come through in terms of, of that process. But with me on the panel is, is uh, uh, some, some great people. Uh, first on, on the list is, is Bob Salisbury. I've known Bob for about, about 20 years. Uh, I didn't know that he was actually out in California doing affordable housing projects and, uh, and prior to that being, uh, or, or after that, uh, working for the community builders as well too, which I, I think highly of is in, in terms of, uh, my picture's only a couple of days old. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought, Bob, maybe you could, you could say a few words about yourself. I am Bob Salisbury, as Ken just said. Is this on? Yeah. Green light. The green light is on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? If you can hear him, it's, it's good. Can you hear him? Yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm Bob Salisbury, as Ken just said. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. I'm a principal at Bonds & Company in uh, Boston, Lexington, Massachusetts. We're real estate advisors and consultants, primarily, almost exclusively now, involved in multifamily housing, both affordable and market rate, both rental and for sale. Uh, we consult with a variety of developers, lenders, nonprofits, state organizations doing tax credit market studies, straight market rate market studies, appraisals, and we're happy to be here. Great. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next on, on our, our panel is uh, David Chulinski, of, of, uh, principal of Krillitz and, and Chulinski. And the reason why I wanted him to be on this, on this committee is because he does this amazing pro these amazing projects in the mid-sized cities, the, the ones like Northampton, that have the, the kind of character and, and quality that you think of as the urban areas, but have to work within these, these smaller communities, smaller cities. And maybe, Dave, you can fill in a little bit about yourself. Sure. We're a 44-person uh, firm. Uh, we're in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, as Ken mentioned, uh, while we do have projects in Alston uh, and Cambridge, and I'm going to show you a little bit of that, uh, we have most of our projects are actually not uh, directly uh, in the center city. Uh, I was just making a very quick list for myself. Uh, we work in Sharon, Brockton, Easton, East. Hampton, uh, if any of you know East Hampton Meadows, um, the Treehouse Foundation, uh, Easton, Massachusetts, North Attleboro, uh, among others, so, um, and East Providence. Uh, so, you know, we are often uh, working with uh, developers in communities that have, you know, a different kind of a resource base, let's just put it that way, uh, than you might find in a major city like uh, Boston. So. I, uh, I appreciate your pain, uh, but also the opportunity, uh, because I'll, I'll just say this, uh, we haven't done work here in your community, but you have an amazing uh, opportunity for people to come to live uh, for lifestyle reasons. And I can tell you from what I understand and the trends of America about moving into small cities and moving back into small cities and towns, you have something amazing to offer. 
that uh, and more than the medallions. That yeah, and more than the medallions, which are the bomb. I have to say, we'll go up in my office. But seriously, uh, you do have something going on, and we just have to figure out a way for you to. And, and one, of the, one of the things I like about uh, his, his firm, Dave's firm, is that they also look at solutions, and not just the architectural solutions, even though they're architects, but the idea of how you figure out how to make something work. Well, we also have the, the, uh, the, local, the local guy as well, too. He's not so local, though, actually, I found out. He's, he's all over the place, but just locally based here in, in, the, uh, in the region. You can tell that he's a local because the way he, doesn't, he didn't put on a tie. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dave Williams, and I'm not an expert, so <laughs> I'm still learning. Uh, I wear several hats. Uh, one is that um, I have a consulting firm uh, that grew out of uh, Ernst & Young's uh, real estate group in Manhattan, and in 1997 I opened uh, my own. I stepped outside of Ernst & Young with a partner, and uh, we do primarily transit-oriented development and uh, brownfields projects all over from here to Michigan to down to Virginia and uh, most recently a lot of our brownfields work is in upstate New York and I don't know if you've been to upstate New York lately but you take cities like Troy, Binghamton uh, and uh, Utica and they wish they had, as David had said, they wish they had the, the, the cultural infrastructure that you have here. The, the, they have a lot of the old buildings, no doubt about that, but they just don't have the, the pizzazz that the Pioneer Valley has. Uh, also, just moving a little bit further forward, is that we just finished a study for the commuter rail, New Haven, Hartford, Springfield commuter rail, that, uh, as I said earlier, <coughs> you should try to lobby your congressman. I think, is Jim McGovern the congressman over here? Yeah. Okay, you got to lobby Jim and Stan Rosenberg, is he over here with the state? Okay, you got to lobby them to get that commuter rail extended to Northampton because it's not, it's not a lost idea. It's not trapped into budget problems. It's going to happen. It's when it's going to happen is the big, big issue. Uh, more recently, about four years ago, I started a, uh, uh, a real estate development company called Archipelago Investments, and we built uh, Boltwood Place, which is behind Judy's Restaurant in Amherst, and it was an instant success. Uh, and I'll tell you more about that later. But we are venturing into uh, two other projects which we hope to break ground on this next spring. Uh, a private luxury dormitory uh, right across the street from UMass and uh, more student and mixed use residential in downtown Amherst, which I'll show you further. But the point is, is that when I first came here 43 years ago, Northampton was half boarded up. I'm not telling you, I'm telling you the truth. It was. And then, all of a sudden, Brink and Brink Thorne and Maisie Cox came to town. Uh, Fitzwillies, I can't remember his name, came to town. You got a mayor by the name of David Musanti, and we have his son. You know, in a, is the uh, uh, the uh, kind of here town manager, town manager <laughs> for Amherst. And we are seeing some amazing things happen in Amherst right now. You've seen some amazing things here. But if you think back 40 some odd years ago, of what Northampton looked like then and what it's like now. You haven't, got a, you haven't got a worry in the world. It's just going to rock it forward if we can just get that commuter rail up here and start organizing some of the property owners in the downtown. <coughs> that's, it. Uh, the, the, that's a very important piece about the, the, the transit and the, and the connection to the, uh, the rail. Recognize, though, that there are a lot of other towns along the way looking to get their own station on the rail line. And if you can make that happen, though, man, this is the, what we've seen. It's, it's, a, it's a real opportunity to try to make the, the town grow and change. Let's talk a little bit about growth and change and, and how that comes about. Uh, one of the things that, that I wanted to talk about a little bit was the, the, the different development styles that, that come along with, with uh, uh, residential development. One of the things that, that I've learned that, that becomes very important is, the, uh, is to think that it's not just one kind, one kind or, or type of, of residential development character or type of, of project that makes sense for, for any location. You have to be unique. You have to have it branded. You have to have, you have, to have a, a, a different kind of, of, of element, a different elements to that, to that development that make it attractive to people. Because there are some people that like to live in suburban environments. There are some people, and more apparently nowadays, that like to live in urban environments. But even within those, there are different kinds of 
different kinds of character of development that comes along with that. And when you think of, of a, uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, development you could have within the, the community, don't necessarily lock yourself into, into one style or, or one character of, of uh, concept of, of how that housing is. Because what you want to do is, is not necessarily look only to that, to the architecture, but also to the eventual users. Who are the people that you want to attract and how do you attract them for the, for the, the kind of, of development you have? And when you think about uh, the idea that uh, you could have, uh, in this slide, the smaller scale uh, development, you could also have something more substantial, the mixed use. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, that I see in, in a lot of uh, slideshows is the idea of making mixed use look like the old style, the turn of the, the, turn of the previous century kind of, uh, of Main Street. And you can't always replicate that because of some of the costs associated with it. But you can think about the idea of contemporary development as well, too, and how that plays into the, the kind of, of development uh, that makes sense for, for a particular community and makes sense of the, uh, the market and the users that come along with that, with that opportunity. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to turn it over to Bob Salisbury at, at this point to talk a little bit about the the market that he's found here. Because one of the things we did was we asked him to say, you know, do we really have a, a, a substantial opportunity here within within the uh, within the real estate market to make, make sense of, of the opportunities that are here? How, and how do we and how do we harness that? Well he's looked at the numbers pretty carefully. He has some ideas that he wants to, to play through in terms of the of the uh, uh, of, of the uh, uh, the development opportunities that you see. So I want to turn it over to Bob now, if you can come up and, and uh, give us your Hi again. I think I'm going to be a little bit of a uh, counterweight to some of Dave's optimism, but hopefully not entirely. Uh, in our uh, <laughs> extensive research, I think the moral of the story here is I have Good news, bad news, but then more good news at the end. The good news is you're in Northampton, as opposed to most any other town around here. The bad news is that you're in Western Massachusetts. So if we go through a couple of slides, and go to the next one, the, the Massachusetts area it shows has little or no job growth in the area. That's the entire Nectar region. Has higher unemployment than the balance of Massachusetts. And both the uh, Springfield Necta and what's called the Amherst Micro Necta also have higher rates of unemployment. And if we look quickly into the demographic trend, I'm sorry, back in unemployment more good news, Massachusetts, the state, has added uh, jobs and has added jobs pretty consistently for most of this year. The Springfield Necta, which is sort of the greater Springfield market, including Northampton, has lost jobs during that same time and has lost jobs over the last several quarters. So. There doesn't appear on a sort of macro regional area to be a lot of growth, and there doesn't appear to be much on the horizon coming up. There's some growth associated with the University of Massachusetts, potentially some growth associated with casinos coming in, although I am a bit of a skeptic in general about casinos. But then this, not surprisingly, translates into limited regional population increases. Some of the areas are actually losing population, but the MSA, which again incorporates uh, Northampton, has had very minor population growth to some loss in population. Now within that area, we get back into some of the more good news. Northampton is continuing to add residents. The secondary market, which we define as sort of the general surrounding area, is also adding population at a somewhat slower rate than Northampton. Northampton is also a comparatively more fluent area. So overall, people that can are moving into Northampton. You have an area that in general is losing population, but the ones that are staying are coming here. So that's it's good for Northampton. It's not great for Western Massachusetts, but that's I'm not sure the solution for that. If we had to do a program like this for all of Western Massachusetts, I probably would have figured out a reason not to be here. But it's Northampton, so we are here. One of the other things that's going to affect development both in Northampton and the area is, is the trends in uh, for sale housing. So what we have here is a comparison of, I don't know if you hear me back, uh, Northampton and two 
counties right around here. The blue bar is Northampton, the other two are the counties. And you can see that single family home prices, and you look at the condo prices, they're the same, have been significantly higher in the city of Northampton and the surrounding area. If you were to superimpose these same trends though on the state, they're lower than the balance of the state. So again, you have an area that when looked at for the entire state, is not doing as well. When you look at Northampton <coughs> compared to the other areas, it's much more competitive. Where does that leave us? Well, sort of within all this, and this to a degree is also occurring in the rest of the region, the rental market is doing, I don't want to say surprisingly well, but it's doing consistently well. Rental developments throughout Massachusetts, in Northampton, and the surrounding areas, are all exhibiting what we consider healthy occupancy levels. Part of the reason out here is that the rental prices make it difficult for people to develop new housing, so there's a limited supply while there's people that need to rent, so that's good. But also, rental prices are going up. And this uh, slide looks at you know, what's called the Springfield submarket. And if you can look at it, you'll see that in the submarket, but also throughout the area, vacancy rates are at what would be historic lows, but they've been like this for a while, while rental rates are continuing to uh, increase. That's all good news for rental development. If you look at the rental developments right around here, they're also increasing, their vacancy rates are staying low, and they're getting rents exclusive of Boltwood, which is at the top of the market in terms of rents, right around two bucks a foot. That gets you into an area that is potentially supporting new development. Again, the, the good news is it's Northampton. Northampton has the ability to attract people that would be less interested in living in Holyoke, South Hadley, even East Hampton. They'd rather live here than Amherst. You know, when we talk to uh, rental managers, I was talking to somebody over at Riverboat Village, their rents are set based on what's going on in Northampton. Northampton sets a rent at $1,500, their rent becomes $1,200 because the only people that get are the people that can't afford the Northampton rents. Given all that, there is, I think, a lot of potential here for a limited amount of new development, almost exclusively for now rental, in, in my opinion. The for sale market is still relatively weak. There is a lot of nice looking units out there that you can buy. So it, that's a tougher, uh, tougher market to get into. But uh, Volkswagen's a great example. A couple other ones I jotted down. There are new developments in towns such as Portland, which while bigger than Northampton, has some of the same qualities. Portsmouth is another example. Even areas like Gardner or Brockton, where you have something that's interesting to people, they're filling them up at the right scale. You could then jump off to on the, uh, the transit one, we are doing work now in Gardner. The difference between Gardner and Lemonster is night and day, partly because the rail line stops east of Gardner. The difference between Northampton and an area with the rail won't be as dramatic because you're Northampton, but if you've got the rail here, the difference between Northampton and, let's say, well, the next town up, it would be it's 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 north of here. Not quite that far off. That'll be night and day too, whatever that town is, unfortunately for it. So, I guess the moral of the story is within an area of uh, declining base in a zero sum game, you've got the sum, and the rest of the area I think is going to get the zero. But there is, I think, real possibility here at any of those sites for a properly uh, designed rental development. And the last point I'll add, and I think either of the two days can speak to this. With the right type of development, and we've seen this throughout uh, New England, you can attract people who, that are attracted based on the design. So you have both of those working with you, whether it's in the finishes and the design and the concept of the open space within the site itself. It's just something to think about. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So now that we had some, some differential in, in, the, uh, in the news on the market, but we're still good, 
let's talk about what the what could be potentially developed. And Dave Chulinski will fill us in on what he's been doing and other locations. So uh, I'm actually going to pick up on uh, on something that was just mentioned. Um, even though we're architects, uh, we are very aware of the fact that uh, in a residential setting, and a and developer by the name of John Corcoran once schooled me on this. He said, you know, I love what you architects do. I really do. He said, but, you know, all the people who live in my rental communities, they all talk to me about the landscape around our projects. You know, they're... I haven't ever had one of them come up to me and tell me that they thought the, beauty, the building was so beautiful they had to live there. But I will tell you this. Um, uh, so I'm actually going to mention uh, a couple of projects. Uh, and uh, this one happens to be in East Providence. And, uh, you, you know, Providence, you hear about, it has its own, um, you know, issues in terms of redeveloping its downtown. East Providence is very interesting because it is not far from the east side where Brown and RISD are located. So much like uh, Northampton, which sort of is very close, right, or, and actually has some higher education in the area, uh, you actually have an opportunity to be a very interesting place to live and uh, to work in that higher uh, ed community which, believe it or not, is part of what is a driver for uh, this uh, Rumford Center project. Uh, many of you probably know uh, what Rumford is. Your mom probably had that little red can of baking you know, powder in her right kitchen cabinet. Well, this is where they made this stuff until they moved to Indiana. Uh, so this was a redevelopment in an area that was predominantly single-family homes. This is a very unusual configuration of buildings. Uh, and uh, not at all what surrounds it, and uh, was principally vacant for about 25 years. Uh, what I want to suggest to you is the buildings had great bones. They had uh, a great opportunity uh, for redevelopment. But the demographic of what they were coming after was actually also very interesting. This was designed in terms of units for people who were under 35 and over 55. And uh, we, it wasn't just for young people who wanted to live in the city. This was also designed uh, specifically with people in mind who own properties in the Providence area, or the East Providence area, or the East Bay area, uh, who wanted to sell their homes, but wanted to not leave the area. And so what I will tell you is the kinds of folks who moved into this, uh, admittedly there were some young people uh, who, um, back here, who, uh, and maybe I can't, I can I back one. Uh, yeah, so, you know, were they, you know, young people who, you know, wanted to live in the city, and that clearly is something uh, that uh, many communities are experiencing, uh, but they also are experiencing the need to create uh, opportunities for people to stay uh, in their community, and not just in a specific senior housing development, which is very targeted to sort of one group uh, of people, uh, I will say, approaching 60 as I am. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I was joking that I'm actually never going to uh, retire, and I'm never going to, it's my ambition never to become a senior. Uh, you know, I actually want to live among the people. I don't want to live uh, in senior housing. I want to live, right, I happen to live in the city. But I want to live with young people, old people, not so old people. Uh, and I think that's a growing trend. So I think when you think about the kinds of things that are appropriate in a place like Northampton, uh, you have to think about the who uh, is going to come. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little story about a neighborhood in uh, Alston. And, 
any of you who went to school in, in BU or at uh, any of the five Fenway schools, I think you know who all, what Alston is, right? It's mostly pubs and students living six at a time in three bedrooms and, you know, it doesn't have a great reputation. Uh, I'm working with a group uh, that went in and took a number of one-story industrial buildings and is uh, basically replacing them uh, with a new neighborhood. Uh, it essentially was a two-and-a-half block area that uh, was in a great location, right? It bordered Brookline. It was near a T station, but it was in Alston. Uh, and the idea behind this is actually to create a green district. Uh, we actually uh, developed buildings that, while they're modern, uh, they actually fit in with the neighborhood in terms of the, the module of the building that was created. You know, the facades break about every 40 or 50 feet. Uh, they're made out of materials that would let you believe that it was built in the new millennium, right? We don't build little old uh, buildings, but I'm not sure you need to. Um, and uh, it, this particular one has parking at grade uh, behind the building. Uh, the outdoor space that accompanies this, and I alluded to that as I came in, is a very important character maker and the amenities that are in uh, these facilities. There are uh, fitness centers, there are small common rooms where people get together, uh, there's a small kitchen, a small uh, home theater kind of space that you can rent uh, in the building to entertain your friends. Uh, the facilities obviously are uh, built like lofts, right? They have a lot of height and a lot of light. Uh, you know, all these things when you're in a, when you're introducing uh, a product, let's say, to a market, having just a little something that you offer that they can't find in existing uh, rental uh, properties is important. This one I'm going to show you because this one really is designed for uh, young people. And the reason I say that is, uh, is it's density. Uh, it's built on the street. It covers an entire city block. Uh, this is across the street, but it has two levels of underground parking. Now, I can tell you from having been involved in things like this, even though the building superstructure is made out of wood and is less than 60 feet and sort of is fairly cost effective, the fact that it has uh, underground parking uh, does mad things to the budget. So uh, what it does allow them to do, however, uh, is uh, to ram 108 uh, units uh, onto the site. And you can see, I think you, from even as small as these are, you can see that the majority of them are actually studios that are approximately 500 square feet, uh, one beds that are 650 to 700, and there are a few two beds, but this is decidedly small. Uh, and it's small for a reason. Uh, but one thing that anecdotally I'm going to share with you about this, this is on the Green Line, uh, which is the Boston College line, which takes you right downtown mm -hmm. in Boston. So everyone sitting there says, oh, so all the people who rent here work downtown. What they found in the first two buildings that they built is that about 5% of the population takes the T to work. Mm -hmm. All these folks... Uh, actually drive. And they work out on the Route 2 corridor uh, and they work out on 128. Uh, they're, they're people who want to live in the city. Uh, they happen to have a job where they have a job. And so wh what I want to leave you scratching your head about is my comment about lifestyle and about people are making choices about where they want to live. Some of it might be around TOD, and some of it might be about uh, the accommodation. Uh, I will tell you that the TOD aspect of this is when these people come home, these under 30s come home, uh, is when they want the tea. They actually go out at night. Uh, they meet their friends. Uh, they 
drink and have a great time. And they're smart enough not to drive. They take the tea. Uh, so uh, the transportation thing is very powerful. But I also want to leave you scratching your head that, you know, it doesn't always mean people will use it to uh, drive themselves to work. It's, uh, it's actually very interesting. People are making decisions uh, based on a lifestyle that they want. Uh, and not, not all about convenience, necessarily. Uh, I'll just, I'll, the last thing, uh, because I'm an architect, and how can I not talk about the fact that it, uh, will people uh, in Boston, uh, I heard somebody uh, quote a statistic the other day, out of 140,000 rental uh, units that are out there, 80% of them were built before 1940. So when, uh, when Dave mentioned something about designing something, offering something new, there are people who will come because you are competing with the 80, and I don't know what the statistics are out here, but there may be 80 or 90% of the other things they're looking at were built before, perhaps, 1940. So new is also interesting. Just leave it with that thought. <clears throat> Thanks, Dave. And uh, I think what you, you've heard is this idea, a lot of ideas of, of choices and, and variety and diversity of, of opportunity. What we're going to talk about next is actual success locally. And for that, we have Dave Bowman. Sorry, I, I tend to move around a bit. I can't stand one spot when I'm talking because as a consultant, you're used to being in high school gymnasiums or whatever at least once a month uh, trying to get people to uh, work, work together, uh, break down into groups, do charrette projects with the architects and the planners and so forth. So uh, there's a lot of physical activity going on. Um, I think Lynn really nailed it on the head when she was talking about uh, residential falling into, into categories such as affordable housing and such as market rate housing. Um, I think that that's the crucial element that's facing our downtowns right now. Our downtowns are undergoing a dramatic change that I have not seen in, in years and, and a lot of that has to do with trends like returning to downtown. The under 30s that Dave was talking about want to be downtown. The seniors want to be downtown. They don't want to be stuck out in an apartment out in the greenfield somewhere. So those trends are really happening right now. Also the fact that uh, as we hit the wall in 2008, people found out that uh, uh, the house was not the most valuable piece of uh, real estate or value investment, valuable investment that they made. And a lot of people lost a lot of money and are still losing a lot of money. So, uh, rentals all of a sudden rose. That is king of the marketplace right now. Especially in Amherst, where student residential is one third of, I mean, excuse me, one half, and Tony can, can challenge me on this, is one half of all of the 6,000 plus houses in Amherst right now are student residential. Uh, we have uh, some very nice people that come in from out of town that can buy a house for three to four hundred thousand dollars stick a dozen students in there, and still clear fifty to 60000 a year and pay the mortgage at the same time. So that's kind of what we're faced with. Uh, against that backdrop, we, uh, I formed a development company, as I said, four years ago, and the first project that we did was Boltwood Place. Uh, it was meant to be um, for a mixed uh, market, primarily uh, UMass, Amherst College, Andrew College professors, which we did get our fair share. We've got our fair share of doctors and so forth. But what was really interesting is we just leased the thing with a simple website that my partner's brother-in-law, is a website developer, put up, just threw it out there on Google, and we got over 800,000 inquiries. And we were also leased up through, have a waiting list through 2015. So that told us one thing, is that downtown residential really is important. And not only that, it's important to have both your mix of affordable and market rate housing because that's what makes our communities work. That's what Northampton wants, that's what Amherst wants. Uh, we're excited about the initiative that, uh, that Amherst has taken in terms of affordable housing because 
Um, we've had a bit of a black eye uh, on one, uh, uh, as you've seen, the, the, the uh, uh, apartment project that had a fire and then also uh, uh, a local um, uh, real estate uh, owner, developer, bought up a bunch of units and he's trying to transfer those into market rate. Well, we've got to make up for that somewhere along the way. And that's what I'm saying is that if you have a developer coming into your community, he's got to understand, he's got to realize it's an education process that he needs to be looking at both those kinds of, of, of properties, that kind of residential going into a community. Uh, we just started out first right off the bat just doing Bullwood Place because we didn't know we were going to be doing other projects. But lo and behold, the planning board last week approved two other projects. Uh, next slide after this. Uh, excuse me, go back one. I'm sorry, there were two on the page. This one is a uh, student residential. Uh, right across the street from UMass, uh, 240 beds. Um, I think the students in Amherst are grossly underserved as far as residential. They're expected to live in squalor, they're expected to live in basements, they're expected to live in situations on campus which are intolerable, such as seven and a half foot ceilings and some of the old 19 post-World War II dormitories. There's one great dormitory which we modeled ourselves after, that's the North, North Apartments on the campus. Four bedroom, two baths, kitchenette. High quality, uh, and it is the first to fill up and it's the most expensive to live in on campus. We model our project after that, saying that our students deserve better. And what's really tough is that working in the state of Massachusetts, there is no public-private partnerships. We just fell into a particular property, which was an old frat, SIG I don't know if there's any SIG ups in here, but they got kicked out. <laughs> The national said, you guys can't have a thousand people in your, uh, in your frat and, uh, on occasions and, and not be responsible. So the nationals closed them down and put the property for sale. So we said, hey, here's an opportunity to really do something that becomes a poster child for what student housing should be like in Amherst, where you've got Amherst College, which is, I don't know if they're number one or number two behind Williams this year, but in any case, in terms of you know, top liberal arts school, but UMass is cooking. UMass is going to go from, uh, from 28,000 students, I think now, up to 35,000 students in the next five years, something like that. They're building as, as much as they possibly can in terms of life sciences on campus. They're building many new classroom buildings. They're really programming that campus to become one of the top 25 research campuses in the country. It's now at number 72, so they've got a ways to go. But we've got a new president of the UMass system in Boston. We've got a new chancellor. We have got a new president at Amherst College, and we also have a new president at uh, Hampshire College. So the planets are aligned, and it gets even better. We have a new congressman, Jim McGovern, which has the Worcester and Amherst district now. We have Stan Rosenberg, which is the first time in 47 years a senator from the state has come from the western part of the state. So I guess that's why I'm saying is that we have a great opportunity in the Pioneer Valley to really start pushing and pushing for what makes us what are, the, what are the drivers in the marketplace? So I've talked a bit about our projects, and I don't see any reason to go further on the projects, but what I would like to say, and so I'd like to get to Q&A really as quick as possible if we, if we can do that. But uh, we've talked about the, the kinds of housing that should be in our community. What do developers want to see? What is the cost of entry? What's the demographics? What are the trends in the marketplace? What are the prices of properties? What is the, uh, what is the, um, uh, the, the wall of, of approvals, of getting in to get your approvals? And also, um, what are the drivers in the marketplace? Uh, I put together kind of a quick, what I thought might be something that we could maybe have a Q&A about, about a 90-day analysis of the three locations that we saw today. What's important is you give yourself 90 days to find out what or to get your due diligence on those three sites. My particular favorite site is the motel site, by the way. <laughs> I think it's a, a winner. It's a total winner. It's got location. It's got access to downtown. It's across the, street, the elementary school. It's got a great setting with all the, the uh, old converted condo mansions around and so forth. But in any case, uh, do your due diligence. Get with the planning department. Find out. Get with public works. Get with the state. Find out who your champions are, especially your political champions. 
Uh, some, and I was glad to hear about the competition for the sites because I think that's where your, your professional consulting team comes in for free. Because there's a lot of architects out there looking for something to do right now. I don't know, David, that's not your case because you're over there in Boston. <laughs> uh, and then put together a feasibility action plan. What's the funding potential for this? What are the demographics? Uh, what's the timeline? You always have to have a timeline here because money is not getting any cheaper and construction costs are not getting any cheaper. So we have about a two to three year timeline in order to get, uh, to get these projects financed and up and running because within probably about five years, our interest rates are going to be back up around five and a half percent and Western Mass construction is probably going to get pretty, pretty busy. Uh, also, look for the potential for public-private partnerships. To me, joint venture is the only way to do anything right now. The whole idea for the public sector is how do you induce, how do you entice the private sector to come in and work with you? And the private sector is looking for opportunities because here again, the chase is on to get as much in the ground as possible in the next three years. So there's an incentive on both sides to do something, especially if you have prime locations. So I guess what I'm saying is that what you really need to do, and you're really way on the way of, uh, of doing it, and, uh, and that is getting these public forums in place, getting checking off these lists, going down through there, and organize yourself so that you can move forward and take these three sites and see which one has the first entry level and get going with it. And get an RFP put together, get it out to the development community, and then start negotiating. You don't have to give them a deal up front, but what you can do is find out what that uh, barrier of, of, of risk going into the project is, and kind of get a discussion going. That's the most important thing. Get people involved. Uh, I've spoken probably too long, but uh, anyway. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that Dave uh, mentioned was the, this idea that there are some sites out there. Uh, when we were asked to help in the, uh, the panel, uh, the uh, planning department had, had identified three sites around, around the uh, downtown area for us to look at and to start to think about how we'd uh, actually apply some of these ideas to those, to those locations. So I wanted to, uh, to identify those sites for you, go through them, and uh, see if the panel has some, some comments on each one of those, and then we can talk, have a little bit of discussion with the uh, with the uh, people here and, and the Q&A that we're talking about. Um, the, the three sites are, are located at the, at the edge of the downtown that do not go into the downtown. We'll, we'll start with the, the uh, Pleasant Street site, which is at, at Wright Avenue. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this site, but uh, it's where the, uh, the old, uh, was it the Mill River, uh, passes, passes through. And, and you may not even notice it when you, when you go down Pleasant Street because of the woods that are, that are around it. The only time you may notice it is if it floods over in, in, the, in the banks. Otherwise, it's culverted and, and, uh, and uh, uh, exists uh, underground. But uh, at the site, the, uh, the property exists appro approximately as shown on, on, this, on this diagram here, uh, with the idea that uh, you have Wright Avenue. Uh, that, uh, you have that, that point? And you may, you may know Wright Avenue, but uh, for this particular, there's an extension here uh, of a right-of-way that is probably the old Wright Avenue. Here's the railroad line coming down here. Uh, you have a, uh, a large piece of, of uh, town-owned land that, that uh, potentially could be some, some open space. Uh, and um, the, this is the location, of approximate location of the stream. Actually, when we went out there, this is what's shown on Google Maps, but the the, uh, the stream actually runs pretty much in the property itself through the, through the woods there and continues on underneath the, in the culvert underneath on the other side of Pleasant Street. So we have environmental issues associated with it. It also is kind of interesting because you, as you come into town, you come over the, the, uh, the, the flood barrier, you're coming down that straightaway, all of a sudden you're seeing <laughs> those, those, those trees in front of you when, you, when you're coming up to, to Wright Avenue because the way the, the other houses are, are, are set back. So this is a highly visible potential gateway to, to the city's downtown. Uh, there's a, um, uh, although it's, it's uh, rather a, a, a small piece, it's still within walking distance of, of, the, uh, of the downtown as, as well too. 
Um, and as I said, there's, there's these uh, uh, requirements that, that come along with it, uh, that, well, not only environmental, but also in terms of, of zoning. Uh, one of the particular ones being important is this 50 foot to riparian setback. So what could you do with that piece of, of land? One of the things that I uh, thought of when we, were, when we were walking out there was this idea of, of reversing the, the sequence, as I call it. The idea of looking at um, the development on this side and the, the tighter parcel over here uh, with the, uh, the stream running through it of making this the open space. So what you have as you come through in, that, in terms of that gateway is the is the green space first and then the, the development behind it. This is partly the idea of, of partnership and, and starting to work with the, with the city in terms of, of the, the properties that are associated with it. But I wanted to take the time now to turn it over to the, the panel. Do you have anything to add since we, we saw that, that parcel? What thoughts on the, the potential development of, of that piece and how that fits into some of the, the, the ideas you brought forward? Uh, yeah, I would just suggest that it's uh, due to the unusual configuration and the, the presence of the stream that, uh, that I, I think, Ken, you're on to something about looking at how the street might better uh, accommodate a building if you're really, like, if you're not going to make the whole thing a park, which also would be a great idea, too, if you could afford it. Uh, but if you're really trying to put a building on this site, it, that existing uh, footprint is going to be very tough by the river. Other members? Not for that side. Well, we may not have we may not have a, somebody jumping on that one quite yet, but the other sites are kind of interesting as well, and they have a real opportunity, I think, in terms of, of the development uh, uh, opportunities that come along with affordable housing and, and housing in general. And and here we're, we're going up to, to Holyoke Street, and you may know this one as the lumber yard, uh, the lumber company on on Pleasant. So we have. Uh, the lumber yard in here, this building is gone, as we found out when we walked through the, the site. I think one of the other buildings is gone as well, too. You have Short Street on this side, a private right-of-way, Holyoke Street coming down this way, underneath the railroad right-of-way, right of, uh, right of and Pleasant Street on, on the frontage. Well, you look at the, at the frontage cool. of the parcel, it has a very little, little uh, a front yard uh, or, or frontage on Pleasant Street itself. It, it really is broken up that way. Uh, <clears throat> but. When you, when you think about the, uh, and, and as, as a matter of fact, the CDC is involved in this right now, looking at this, at this piece of land and, and trying to figure out exactly what, what should be going on there. So when we prevent, present some ideas here, they aren't the CDCs, they're, they're our own panel's ideas about how we, we've uh, looked at, at this opportunity. But this is a large piece of land. Uh, we have a, over an acre of land right at the edge of the, of the downtown. Uh, with, and zoned uh, central business. Uh, as you see in, in the, the picture on the top, uh, part of the, uh, of the frontage that is not owned by the, by the, by the lumber yard is that garage at, at that location right there in the, uh, in the image. Um, but what if you were to think about the, the, the way this gets developed uh, with the zoning fairly relaxed, 70-foot uh, uh, height, 0-foot uh, setbacks, um, a fairly substantial opportunity for, for development as, as an urban kind of scale. So what we did was, we, uh, the urban designers in our office uh, went and thought about, try to imagine something and, and really started to think, you know, the idea of maybe a courtyard kind of, of development where it's a podium kind of construction with, uh, with a parking underneath the, the, the building so that you, you drive through the building and parking mm -hmm. through there, come out in Short Street and have the access on on Holyoke Street, uh, obtain the, the, the piece of land, uh, uh, you know, and this is where the city gets involved in the process and, <laughs> and has to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to use potentially some powers of eminent domain, but, or, or some agreement, maybe it's a friendly agreement, with the property. So you create some real frontage across here, uh, the idea of the relief in between, so you can have some kind of commercial development and residential behind, just some of the initial thoughts. But because of the size of this piece of land and, and its location and the opportunity and the development. Now, one of the things you have to remember is when, when Bob was saying that you know, there, there's a market there, uh, you have to really think hard about what, where, how you're going to grab that, that market and make, make this kind of density work. But uh, I would turn it to the panel and see if there's, if there's some thoughts as to uh, what you think in terms of the, uh, uh, this piece of land and what, what opportunities it provides. Sure. 
Well, I have to go back out to a big picture uh, view, and that is that if I were in your shoes, I would be looking for uh, success stories. I think that's what you have to do, is you have to find out where, what project, what property, or not, not necessarily these three properties, but maybe there are other properties where you can get wins a lot quicker. Uh, and, and to me, that's, that's what's important, because the development community is going to be looking for something that is going to allow them, from day one, to lease up that, that space. That's, that's the name of the game. I mean, they're putting at risk millions of dollars, and uh, they want to see some return on that investment. And they also want to see it happen very quickly. My sense on this, on these two properties here, uh, is that these are uh, longer term projects. They're going to have to wait until something happens in that neighborhood uh, before that you can uh, that you can take them out and put an RFP and actually look somebody in the eye and say, "Hey, it's going to go. It's great." You know. Uh, my sense is that that there are probably other properties where you can get that early on success so that you have a story to tell to the development community. That's so important that you do that. Um, some communities have a, uh, uh, well, I can go back to the 80s, okay? Let me tell you a story here. I was on the design review board in Amherst, and uh, I felt like I was alone there because it, it, everybody was out to kind of give it to somebody when they came before the design review board. You know, it's like, well, I don't like your planting, or I don't like this. First words out of their mouth is, hey guys, we're not here to critique what they're doing. We're here to help them do something better than what they're bringing in. Well, I'm telling you, the world has really changed in Amherst since then. It's become more business friendly. The planning board is all professionals. It's people who understand both sides of the fence. Same way with the DRB, and I think that that's very important that you encourage that private sector to come in and work with them, not work against them. Just because you got on the wrong side of the bed that morning doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have to, you know, work somebody over. So I, I guess what I'm saying is that we're in an economy now where the city and the, and the private sector have to work together if they're going to get any success stories, get anything out there that looks close to what David presented earlier over in. God's country in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else from the other panelists? I guess I partially agree with what, what they've said. I think. I think you do have to be uh, very uh, concerned about sequencing because, again, what, what I'm looking at is a, an area that hasn't had a really nice, splashy new development for a while. So I am thinking that wherever you put that in the, let's call it the greater downtown area, you have, the, you have a good chance for it to fill up. But because of all the, the negative market stuff I said before, you're going to be drawing people that for the most part are already here and this may be your one best shot at it. So if this one goes up first and looks great, I think you'll get people in there. You may have more difficulty than for the next one. So that's one thing to consider. And again, because you are trying to, in a sense, create a market, I think a site like this has to be developed with the idea that there are certain things that make people want to come here, whether it's live work in, you can't see the point in in these areas right here, whether there's an art gallery within the building as one of the site amenities, something that begins to have people drawn to it. But I do think the third site is going to be seen as a superior site. But I think either one of those two have the potential for being redeveloped. I don't know then if you'll be able to redevelop the second one as quickly. So that's just food for thought. And I was going to, uh, I was just going to add, just from a design standpoint, that this notion that's floated here of a couple of different uh, structures and maybe sort of a landscape courtyard in between, I think offers some opportunity. Um, one of the challenges I think you have, because the absorption, now I'm going to not sound like an architect here for a second, but the net absorption of new rental, like if there are, I, I don't know how many units this performers out at, but if that were 100, let's suggest for a second it is. I mean, that's actually a fairly large project to try to absorb right downtown. 
but if one of the buildings is 40 and the other building is 60, the fact that you build it over time, the fact that you know you could actually you know, get a success in the first building, build the second building, and you know not be in a situation where you're trying to absorb 100 units all at once. Um, there's some, there's going to be some scaling, and this is where I'm definitely out of my league because I'm a bricks and sticks guy. But this notion about dividing the parcel up into something that has manageable bites uh, probably is a reasonable approach. Dave yeah. just hit on the word absorption, and uh, here again, this is what any developer does that's worth his salt, is he tries to identify what's the absorption rate for the number of units he can build a year, whether it's houses, whether it's apartments, whether no matter what it is. So that's the way he, uh, he uh, stacks his financing. That's how he goes to equity partners and shows them what his capabilities are in that particular community. So it's not that you're just working with a developer, you're working with a whole team of people out there that don't even know each other. I mean, I'm going to the equity markets right now to, to make my projects happen. And I know the criteria that they want, what they want to see. And this, has, this works for both affordable units market rate units, you name it, anything residential, you're going to have to go after an equity partner and he's going to have his, his uh, 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 he's going to set the table his way unless you have some great stories to tell behind your uh, idea so that you can set the table because it's all negotiated at that point which has nothing to do with the town. Um, there was another point that I was thinking, but at my age, things tend to <laughs> Sorry, we'll back just to go. We'll, we'll get back to that. Yeah. And, and we mentioned a, uh, a third site here, so let's get over to the, the, the last one as well, too, which is the uh, um, at, uh, at Bridge Street. And um, you may know this is the old uh, motel that's um, boarded up now on the on the street that, that's located there. Uh, we're also looking at the uh, adjacent properties, uh, residential, former residential properties or existing residential properties that, that uh, surround it. Uh, and, and, and it's a fairly good sized piece of land. We're talking about something over a, uh, a half acre of, of land uh, with uh, its own uh, urban urban residential. Uh, it is, it, it, there is a for sale sign up there. We don't know exactly what the, the status, but um, <clears throat> uh, the, the neighbors have been open to uh, potentially uh, uh, some density in the, in the housing. Uh, the, the zoning does allow some, some substantial uh, uh, development uh, and there is a uh, an, uh, 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 and, and it, is, it is an attractive property as, as we found out as we walked out there when and the panel saw the, the property as well too. Again, our urban designers went and looked at it and said, "How could I, how could we maximize something that, that gets put on that property?" Because this seems like a great opportunity as well too. Uh, the same idea with the courtyard concept with with parking that, that goes underneath. But when you, when you, you it, it doesn't necessarily fit with the with the uh, kind of uh, uh, old Victorians that, that exist around the area, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Uh, and I, I think this is something you should recognize as, as well in terms of the, the opportunity that comes along with it. That there's some there's some density that can be created, and it can still look and start to fit and feel appropriate to the to the location. But since my panel said that they were interested in, in making this thing happen, maybe we can you can add some of your own thoughts as to as to where this goes. Just let me know if I'm dominating the, the microphone here. Um, in the old days, uh, a market analysis amounted to this. It was getting in a helicopter, getting up and going over the, the city or the town or whatever, and if your project was a shopping center or a commercial office building, you were looking for rooftops. It was called a rooftop survey. If you saw a lot of rooftops concentrated in one area, then you started looking for land around that particular project, uh, that, those rooftops, in order to select a site and put in a shopping center. Well, it's not that way anymore. You're, it's very, very complex. Um, and, but this particular site, uh, as I said before, has so much going for it in terms of its location. Uh, it's just down the street from a bus stop, which is 51 points of your gold lead, uh, uh, lead certification. So if you want to do a, a lead building here, uh, you can get 51 points 
and that's half your point. Just because of your proximity to downtown and your proximity to that bus, bus uh, stop. So there's many things that you have to look at now in order to identify the, the positives and the negatives of a site. Not only that, you're across from a, a, a cultural mecca here, which I call it that because it's the historic uh, zone, which just looks fabulous. And you're across the street from an elementary school. You're in a neighborhood. You have this incredible backdrop of, of uh, eight, uh, 19th century buildings. Uh, they must have been the, the uh, manufacturing uh, you know, gurus at the time, and had, were the uh, homes of the people who had all the manufacturing facilities here, I don't know. But in any case, it's, it's a fabulous location. Also, it has great visibility in terms of trying to attract people into your downtown. When you turn that corner, uh, or when you're coming down the bend, that's what you see in the distance. And so there's an opportunity to create a focal point right here at that corner. Also, there's a possibility with the town owned land here to create a pocket park. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with this that make it very, uh, very attractive to the development community. So I guess my, my, uh, my take is that I prefer, uh, out of all the sites we saw, in fact, about any site that I know of in the downtown, uh, except for Jack August, I think that's a great location too. I don't know if anybody here remembers Jack August. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, that is a fabulous site, and it's totally underutilized. Uh, and this would, this would be my first choice, and the Jack August would be the second. Thanks, Dad. Anything else in the Yeah, I would just uh, throw out that um, I mean, we do a lot of work. Uh, part of a, another part of our business, besides the multifamily work we do, is with uh, retail, uh, and we are involved in mixed-use buildings that have retail from ground floor and you know, residential above. But they tend to be in very dense neighborhoods. They tend to be in areas where there is an active street life, uh, where there's an established pattern of retail uh, at the ground floors. And so all we're doing when we do that is to fill in a missing tooth shall we say, right, in the, in the street wall. Uh, so it's not hard to manage in uh, talking some retailer into going in and taking that space. Um, I know, uh, right, good city planning, town planning, we try to have active ground floors. This site's a little challenge, you know, when you look at the rest of the buildings uh, along the street right there, there actually isn't a ground floor established, you know, retail, uh, you know, pattern. Um, so you, you might want to think about being creative on the ground floor of whatever happens here. Uh, I was asking, and it appears that you do have a live-work uh, provision. I, maybe there are some interesting things that you could do with that space that would activate it um, and, you know, make it uh, a plus, uh, but wouldn't look to do conventional retail because it's sort of hard for me to imagine in that particular location, it being successful. So uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to ask you to put your thinking cap on. You know, you know what are the things that your community uh, needs uh, and can offer uh, somebody to come to that location to do and to inhabit, uh, but it just might not be conventional. Either. So it looks like from the, uh, the sounds of the outside there that we're going to be here a while. <laughs> So I hope you have some, some questions. Uh, unless there's some, some final pieces from there, can we flip, can somebody flip on the, the lights and um, so we can see each other? And be happy to have uh, open it up to, uh, to questions from the audience and uh, further comments from the, from the panel. Yes, sir. For whatever it's worth, I wanted to offer a couple of thoughts pertaining to the rail amount of development going on in the city right now. I serve as the city's economic development director. I think it's worthwhile to know that right now, the city has about 10 projects that are well underway with a value of about $80 million that include uh, 108 new hotel rooms that are going to be being constructed down block from here. Uh, 80,000 square feet of office space is being completed at the Athens Drive business park. There's very serious discussion of an additional 80,000 square foot building, which
which for the city would be tremendously exciting to have that big block of space sitting on 991. Of, of commercial or industrial? Class space. A office space. Class A office, nice. Which is being met by the health, the, the, the evolving changes in healthcare services delivery. That's obviously become an office space driver, and so they're meeting that market. Um, parallel to that, the city has worked for many years to rezone and revision King Street. And you can clearly see that that vision has now become very, very real with, with all kinds of retail going into King Street, adding to the city's tax base as well, which is also positive to see. In the last two or three years, there have been a number of car dealerships, banks that have all built brand new buildings. Um, there's more new construction on the way for King Street, closer toward the downtown. Uh, the Grantham Group is building 83 units of assisted living up at Village Hill, which is also positive. And the, I always confuse, Gatehouse Carriage House, the Gatehouse Project done by Opal, is about to have its ribbon cutting, I believe, for another office space. And these are there, which is very, very exciting. So there's a whole host of very exciting hotel, residential, retail projects going on in the city. Are, are great to see. It sounds like you've been doing your job then, I guess. <laughs> well, I've arrived, I've been here less than a year, so all of the, the, the this is seed corn that was placed well before, you know, I've arrived, and now it's it's harvest time for many of these projects. There's, there's no question. That's great, that's very exciting. That's <laughs> Secondarily, the, the, the whole issue of the, of the rail, I, I just wanted to echo it because that is, to me, um, having watched, we've all watched rail grow in Northern Virginia, we've watched the metro grow in out and turn the District of Columbia into a vast office suburban market. I've seen commuter rail in the Hudson Valley and Fairfield, Connecticut areas grow, but to the point that if you don't have the parking to it on top of the station, then it becomes a, a very a real struggle. I've watched Stanford go from being bedroom where, as one of the speakers had alluded to, where people move into New York City and end up working in Stanford. So today, there are more commuters coming into Stanford from New York City than there are leaving Stanford in the morning going into New York City. So the reverse commute is as much of a trend as traditional commute. To get rail here, I think, might address in a long-term way some of the job deficiencies and the job anemia that this region has, because rail will, in essence, generate jobs from all numbers of angles, whether it's digital nomads, transitional entrepreneurs, people who don't need, who don't have a traditional five-day-a-week job. A three-hour commute to Penn Station is a very attractive reality. Tourism, uh, visitorship, that creates jobs. So, that, so, so, so to get the Vermonters, great, but we need to build on getting five or six trains going either way to connect to New Haven and to, into New York City. I think that's the real, real foundation for growth. That's a very important point, that transit-oriented development doesn't just mean the housing, it also means uh, economic development and commercial in, in style as well, too. Other questions or comments? Uh, well, go ahead, Peg. Talk about the renter desire versus ownership that we were talking about earlier. The, um, the, the uh, uh, and I think that, that came from, from Bob, and, and, uh, and Dave, maybe you, you want to come up and, and talk a little bit about it. Um, we had specifically, though, what, what is your question? People want to rent. Oh, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of changes in the last, let's say, four or five years, whether they're social or financial, people aren't sure. But the, the short answer is the percentage of homeowners has been dropping for a while, and it's getting lower than it's been in the last 30 years. There are a number of these applying to cohorts that are opting to rent instead of buy, even when it appears not to make financial sense. And from their point of view, it might make sense. There's a number of reasons. One is uh, concern about one's job, whether you're going to have it in the long term, whether you have to relocate in the long term, whether you just desire to relocate anyway. There are more barriers to entry now into the for sale market than there were, including uh, more financial uh, Security to begin with, a much more arduous approval process. So there are people that either can't go through the approval process or just don't want to bother. Uh, there are still concerns about the strength of the for sale housing market. If you get into it, the bottom falls out, what are you left with? There are concerns about interest rate creep, that if you buy a house that's affordable at 
four percent, all of a sudden the rate's five percent, you can still afford your house, but you're trapped in it. And there are people that just don't desire to have a house. I think part of the results of the impact of the last housing crisis is uh, the bloom is off the home ownership rows, that people were just, it was drummed into, you weren't successful if you didn't own a house. And if you take a step back, you say, well, you know, I don't know if I really want to have a house. I don't want to spend my weekends raking the leaves. So there are more and more people now renting. And in the multifamily market, rental housing is far and away the most attractive investment because the vacancy rates are very low, rents are going up, and people are just buying them at, to use another plenty word, at, at crazy amounts of money. So all of that means more and more people now are interested in renting. Where that's going to go, it looks reasonably certain that in the short term, rental is going to be more attractive than home ownership in terms of where things were because people are still scared about housing prices, about the strength of the economy, the future of the economy, where interest rates are going to go. All of that uh, leads itself to people being concerned about buying a house. Okay. Uh, there's also another thing at play here, and that is all your major developers are, are not doing Greenfield anymore. They are coming back to downtown, doing smaller projects, infill projects. I mean, Beacon Properties, Avalon, any of the big guys, Greenfield is off the board. They're trying to find these downtown properties and cities as fast as they possibly can because the rents are higher, uh, the development costs are higher as well, but uh, the trend is out of the green fields and into the downtowns. And rental is where the action is. So I think that you know once the big guys start identifying where the market is, that's where they go and that's where they're headed right now. So that's good news for downtown. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't talk enough about all the good things that happened, you know, out on King Street and so on and so forth, but uh, I think that my thing is focus on the downtown. That's where lifestyle begins in our city. So the whole idea right now is back to downtown. Let's get those canopies out off of the storefronts like we used to see back in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Let's get hitching rails back. I mean, anything that you can make your downtown be a place that is, 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 is reminiscent of, of what it used to be. We were working in uh, Binghamton, New York, and we were in a, in a charrette, and one woman stood up and she says, I wish my street could be like it was when I grew up back in the 40s. Well, that just melted my heart because that's, that's what people think about now. That's what the downtowns mean to them now. They want to go back to the future, I guess, is when, what you might call it, Jim. So, anyway. And one of the things we kind of talked about with all this is the uh, the impact of senior renters, which as people age in place, as they uh, get to a period in their life where they either have no desire to own a home anymore or don't feel they're either financially capable or physically capable of owning, in a number of markets they are selling their houses and they're looking to rent. They're not looking to buy the way they were even like five years ago or maybe 10 years ago now. The big market was senior condominium development seeing now are more and more senior rental, whether it's just a typical development that is mostly seniors or independent living, where people are paying you know, three to five to six thousand dollars for a limited number of services, but knowing that those are available. But it's just a whole other facet of the rental market that is outpacing the for sale market. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to, um, looking at this, and it seems like it's sort of people's most you know, preferred site or most exciting site, and a couple of things I'm noticing. I'll just say I'm a little bit more bullish on extending the downtown, and one of my colleagues back here said, no, you're right, people won't walk down there. So thinking about that, I'm wondering why you have a blank wall as you're bringing people down from the downtown, and then you're awnings, and then you've cut off the corner and put trees, and I could see that as a really exciting outdoor space. Like, what would excite me is seeing people hanging out whether it's a restaurant with an outdoor seating area, I would say enliven your facade, and I think you actually could bring people down from the downtown and get rid of the kind of blank wall. So you oriented your outdoor space for the community in the courtyard, and I would say open it up. 
so that people can see that vibrancy and that's going to yeah. excite people about the So you know what's great about this diagram? It was supposed to get people talking. <laughs> we leave a few plunkers in there and let you criticize the, the work of your designers in your shop, but it's like no, 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 I mean, it's really a massing study, and then there's exactly. one of those silly facade window things. So it doesn't it doesn't articulate at all like anything around them. Where did the lumber yard site? So we're looking at massing study, but nothing articulated. It doesn't look like townhouses. The back of the lumber yard. So it's like soften it up so people can imagine it really. And that can be part of the process. We, and, and this is exactly exactly the kind of conversation you want to probably have. If you have a developer that's going to be interested in the property, what are the criteria that you're going to apply? And what's the character of the kind of development you, you want to have in that, in that property? This green space, green space in the front, is that idea of creating that big public space, because that is public land that's within the right-of-way. It can be part of that connection with what happens. Those I think this trees, is a terrible two place. Trees. The two trees I, I, the, if, the, if the trees, we'll, we'll take that out. That's easy enough to do. <laughs> <laughs> Erase. There is a green there, another architect's, an architect's agreement. <laughs> and, and Dave told me the time that, that he was doing trees on his plans with cigarette butts, too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, question over here, come. Uh, I guess both. Um, the reason that Northampton is so vibrant is because of its downtown and the stores and the restaurants. We all love that. Um, and what, uh, I guess this is a chicken before the egg question. Um, over the last five or six years, you've seen a number of businesses that, have, that were the ones that came in the 70s and made the downtown vibrant, close. And so how do you keep that retail, commercial, downtown district vibrant at the same time that you're drawing people to live there? Is it, do you bring the people to live there and that grows that vibrancy? Or do you bring the businesses and that draws the people to live there? A, a chicken or egg kind of, of issue. You know, one of the things when we work in, we work in a lot of downtowns and uh, there are communities that say, how come there's so many banks in our downtown? I mean, we're, we seem to be overrun with banks. The reason is because you have a lot of money and you don't bank online. You go to the storefronts. The storefronts will be, will be successful based on the market that they have available to them. And the idea that you have um, a very diverse community and it's, it's very successful from, from our perspective. And now, one of the, I, I love this town. I, I, I realized after doing the Sustainable Northampton Master Plan, you got to love a town to be able to do a, a good master plan for it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, that's, and it just plays out nicely. There's so many good things that, that happen here. One of the things you may be concerned with, with is the idea that there's some vacancies or your favorite business is, is left, left town. Well, there may be some other business that comes in and fills that space. It, it isn't necessarily going to be the, the, uh, the end of the downtown because one business has, has gone. Uh, and I think that that's a, that's a characteristic of, of, of uh, communities that you'll see change over. You'll see changes in, in the market and changes in the businesses associated with the, the spaces that are, that are downtown. Yeah, I want to say one of the, um, one of the challenges uh, about cities, towns, is they are organic. And as much as we love how they were, um, vibrant cities are always changing. That, it's, it, oh, it's the, the nature of the most vibrant cities is that they are always changing. And so it's, it's one of those things uh, that uh, sometimes it's family uh, businesses. You know, somebody uh, starts a restaurant, they're 30 years old. Well, you know, 30 years later, they're 60 years old. Or, you know, and if they don't have a kid who wants to get into the business, uh, you know, it's run its course. And so it needs the next generation, the next entrepreneur to come in and, and to do their things, unless it's a chain and then you're dealing with some national thing and they solve who runs it in a different way. But, um, you know, cities are amazingly organic and it, you kind of have to get used to the fact that some of the stuff you love does slip away uh, and get changed over time. Bob, I was going to add one other thing too, that it's important to remember, and that was again my sort of good news, bad news, is that while everyone agrees Northampton is a fantastic place, it, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. And businesses closing here 
closed in part because we had a recession nationally and businesses were closing everywhere. The uh, development we're talking about is not going to be able to buck the national trends when it comes to any sort of new retail, et cetera. If you bring new people in, you will have a new vibrancy and that'll help. But that overall issue is still there. So it's just something to be aware of that building a couple of beautiful new buildings and bringing a hundred new households in will, will help. It will help less if, in fact, you're bringing households that already lived here and they just moved or if they're coming from a different area. But that's still a, uh, an overriding factor that just, you can't be ignored. A lot of hands. I think I had this hand in the front first. Um, I'm Diane Wiley, and I wanted to put on the radar uh, co-housing as a small slice of what's going on in uh, proactive development of housing, which is residents get involved in creating the housing. Um, I live in co-housing. I've been there 18 years in Amherst, and I've been to a lot of them around the country, and there's a lot of pent-up demand for uh, people, both young and seniors. You're talking about the people who both want to own and rent, and residents who want to live more sustainably, smaller spaces, um, but also promote uh, a mixed, uh, you know, the mixed uh, affordable housing, market rate housing. We did that in our own community. A third of our units were um, affordable that were internally subsidized because we wanted to live on the property that we're on. So we internally subsidized. It wasn't any public funding to pay for those uh, units so that we could buy the property from the town of Amherst. Um, the property I'm thinking of that fits for the second and third sites um, so there's about 150 co-housing communities around the country, um, and a lot of people want to move to this area from other parts of the country, by the way. Um, but Swan's Market in Oakland, California is one example that I could think of that has, it's got affordable housing, it's got co-housing in it. The whole thing is not co-housing, it's got retail space, offices, affordable housing, and a co-housing component in it. Um, there's also been in uh, Emeryville, I think it is, that did the strip mall that they turned into condos. Um, and uh, the newest thing that's going on in the United States that's being brought over from Denmark, because that's where the co-housing phenomenon came from, they've been doing co-housing for 40 years, we've been doing it for about 30 years here, um, is senior co-housing. Because again, to all the, the points that you were making before, uh, boomers want to live in a walkable place. Um, they have money. Some of them want to be renters because they don't want to own anymore. Some do, and they're very, very interested in having an impact, a positive impact in their community. So they're, they're activists in that way to help with affordable housing, to help with uh, animating um, spaces beyond just where they live, and to be a, part of, a bigger part of their community. So ours over in Amherst, we're very active. We're active in town meeting. We're active in our uh, immediate neighborhood. So I would say I would really love to see co-housing be on the radar in the development process in Northampton and elsewhere. Got a few hands up. Who's next? In the back. Uh, question for uh, Dave Williams. If you could comment on your experience with parking on your infill project at uh, place and whether or not um, the availability or the availability of parking uh, impacted your project. Um, what we did is we rented 12 spaces in the parking garage down below, and those are for our tenants. But the amazing thing about it is that only eight tenants use those parking spaces. The, uh, the uh, dean of students at Hampshire College doesn't even have a driver's license. And he, he has a sister, I think, lives here in Northampton, and he just rides the buses or walks or whatever. Uh, so what we're finding is that, especially with students right nowadays, uh, and given Pioneer Valley Transit, which is incredible, uh, we have those articulated buses over in Amherst. I don't know if you've seen those things, but that's something you would normally find in Kansas City or Chicago or someplace. In, in Amherst, they, they really look out of place, but as was explained to me, uh, when you've got 100 students sitting out there at a bus stop waiting to get to a 9 o'clock class, you just can't do it by putting more buses on the on the thing. You've got to get bigger buses in there. So that's what I understand. But what we did is in in, uh, in public places provided the parking spot, even though uh, a lot of people don't use them. Also, another trend is that we're we're hearing, and I heard this on NPR the other day, that for college students, 
uh, parents are given the choice of a computer and you know, all the technology stuff, all the digital stuff, uh, a car or college. Pick two. <laughs> car is the last thing they pick, especially here because mass transit is so so phenomenal. So, uh, and the fact that um, LEED certification is now considering location of transportation as being a major part of your of, of your project in order to get that, and we see LEED certification as a marketing tool. Not so, I mean, it, it's great to be save energy and so forth. In fact, we in Boulder Place we have uh, one family who didn't turn their furnace on in January. I mean, it's crazy. It's because the building is so tight, and that's that's what it comes down to. A lot of people say. Good. It's going to cost you 20% more to build your building and so on and so forth. Well, that might be the case. But the energy that you save in these buildings by having such a tight envelope, it, it's well worth the effort because it, it works for everybody. It works for you, works for your tenants, and so forth. Now, in the two new projects that we're doing, uh, Olympia Place is right across the street from UMass parking lots, uh, which were in an old fraternity sorority area, which have never been parked in for the past 40 years. Um, and that's because it's off campus, and they used it for when they were building the uh, the honors dorms and the new life science building. That was where the construction guys would park and then walk over to their to their jobs. So we have the parking. We have over 650 parking spaces available there. And given these new trends, we also have a bus stop, and the bus loops right through there every day, three times a day. And um, so that we're finding that. Transportation and access is taken care of by Pioneer Valley. Uh, for downtown, uh, we have very limited space on this site in order to develop it and, and uh, make sure that it has a return on investment to uh, investors. Is that we uh, cannot put in parking, but what we do is we put in four zip cars. And four zip cars can almost, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a zip car, oh, yes. uh, but it, uh, it, it, it has a cumulative effect of about a hundred cars parking. So it's uh, it's it's really going to do a good job for us, we think. <coughs> Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes. So I think Diana mentioned affordable housing, but I don't really hear much about the impact on affordable housing as high end housing is being built. You know what's happening in Amherst right now, which are folks can't afford to live there. And as you're building more and more expensive housing, folks who had lived there, like, like number three up there, I don't know if that includes Coolidge Village, which is next door, or if that excludes the apartments there. It does not, okay. But that could then raise those rents, so then where do those people move, and then where do people who have the section of vouchers move? So I'd like to hear maybe some. Uh, everything that we've shown you here and everything we talked about is the idea that there'd be affordable housing that gets included in it. One of the things that Dave Williams was talking about was the idea that there were some luxury units that came in to, and they were successful because they, they found that particular market niche. But all of these projects can include affordable housing in them and can be part of, can be part of, that, of that opportunity that you see in the, in the development projects. I don't know if you want to add anything else in that. And I think we're all looking for the diversity of housing and, and, and affordability is just one of the key components of it. But some of what you're describing is making it a more homogeneous kind of community, really. You're really pushing people out of downtown areas where things are accessible for people to walk, the schools across the street. Well, if, if, we're, if we're putting more people onto a piece of property, and this is, this is what happens with the infill and the redevelopment, we're putting more people onto this piece of property, and that's part of the reason why the zoning is, has been relaxed, to allow more density, to allow more units, to allow more people. By having a different character of the development, a different, different structure on the, on the property, there can be more people that can take advantage of the bus stop, of the schools, of the downtown. Right now on the lumber yard, nobody's living there. And with the idea of a development project that, that puts in a mix of, of residential units, that you can have the more people in, in the downtown on that piece of property. I think my question is, are they affordable? Yeah, it's yeah, yes, and they can be affordable. Yes. It really hasn't been. And that's part of the pro forma and, and the process of trying to figure out exactly, start to pencil it out. How many units do I need to create the kind of affordability that you want? And you, the minimum affordability that you want to have is 25% or is it 50% or, or what is it that may be in, in, in the process? That starts to affect what the design looks like in terms of the, of the project. Had a, 
and in the front here first thing. Uh, actually, in terms before we just before we leave that, I just want to also leave everybody with um, the, the struggle about uh, bringing in uh, when you're creating. If you have demand, if you have people who want to live someplace, unless you continue to build new, they will compete for what you have. Um, and I can tell you in my hometown of Cambridge, uh, if you don't continue to build housing and people, and you live in a desirable place, and I will suggest that you are like Cambridge, a very desirable place to live, people will compete and rents go up because the supply does not change and the demand is there. So, in fact, the notion of building any new housing, even if it isn't tabbed affordable, is actually a strategy about affordability. So some, some of it would truly be affordable, right, where some of them would be earmarked to be workforce, right, at, you know, some 100% of AMI or 80% of AMI, I mean, it isn't necessarily what we might consider, you know, extremely poor and affordable folks. I mean, workforce housing is a great thing to create. Um, and frankly, you know, we're, we work in a lot of towns that have a lot of affordable housing. It's the last thing they actually want to see built. And I don't know that that's your problem, but building more housing just in general will help maintain the affordability of what you have. Mm -hmm. Because other than that, the demand will actually force rents up. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, downtown Northampton has you know very limited development potential. The sites are few and far between. These three sites. I mean, what do you suggest for the city to have a strategy to make sure there are affordable units in, in any of those three developments, if they ever happen, uh, without you know denying the developer the permit unless he does it. And and in fact, I, do you have an inclusionary zoning? You do not. So you have to. So this this is not a question that you can bring up to say. How do you ensure? Uh, one of the key ways to do that is if you own that piece of property, you can dictate what gets put on it, uh, and that's the developer's agreement that comes along with it. You can say, "Here's what here's what you have to here's the, the minimum criteria you have to have to compete with with the uh, yeah, but without the inclusionary zoning." Yeah. Uh, but if you own the property, if you if you can control it with the developer's agreement, you can say what. In terms of the city owning these properties, or the or non-profit developer? The, the city owning it. Or the city city. So this site, for example, is, and Ken's drawn here, is more more units than the current zoning allows. So this would only be developed as either 40 feet or 40 yard, both of which require a certain amount. Okay, that, and that kind of gets at my, my question of, uh, I've seen the city change in the last 20 years where affordability has evaporated. I agree. Because it is a popular place to live. It is a place that, that people want to want to be, uh, and affordable units in this town are are few and are, are becoming less and less. And and so when you start to see some opportunity, you want to make sure that you have affordability the, included in it. This is the mission of the housing partnership, the Infant Housing Partnership. Yeah, so. and and you can keep that up as well too. In the back there. And And then just the last word, um, my sense is that 
our communities. Um, we aren't seeing the growth of high-end jobs that we'd like to in Western Mass, or even good, solid blue-collar jobs. So when you have a couple of child care teachers married to each other, they want to come to Northampton for our schools, as well as the vibrant downtown. They will not qualify for a subsidy with almost any government program, but they get frozen out when the mm -hmm. home ownership opportunities and then even some of the rental opportunities draw people with, uh, with bigger pocketbooks. Mm -hmm. We love having those people, but um, the, the, we still have problems and we can't control markets. Um, we still have problems, I think, convincing people when you do a big new building thing and they're, they're starting to worry about the traffic the looks, um, and I agree with Connie's comments, by the way, but that's beside the point. Um, and what percentage is affordable, um, that I think will be one of the concerns that you hear if it's, if it's getting in both ends of the income uh, spectrum, that it reduces the desirability in terms of the neighborhood. But then just to finish with the question, um, assuming that we don't have to like that tree planting or whatever, um, but that you've done some kind of a projection of massing, which is related to the number of units, how many units are, are um, in that picture? I don't know how many units in that picture. It's just the concept that has said to, to, to generate that exactly that kind of interest. By the way, are, are there developers in the, uh, in the audience? There's a CDC, few, uh, yeah. almost no developers. Um, are any of the properties there of interest? Well, Joanne Campbell Valley CDC, we have a purchase and sale agreement for the lumber yard, so we're doing our due diligence. But I just, as far as like, the income for the, um, the, the family units that are developed under tax credit, federal tax, you know, local housing tax credit program, serve people generally between twenty-five and fifty thousand dollars. Um, so you are reaching okay. daycare. So the, those ranges are there, um, you know. And the income, just so you know, fits in with what talking about you know, good jobs here is that our incomes have gone down here the last time the numbers came out. So last year, I don't single person might have been you know forty nine thousand dollars for eighty percent of me. Now it's like forty five. So <laughs> the lack of good jobs uh, you know, is a major problem here. Um, but the, the tax credit programs do serve people at that income range. When we're talking about homeless individuals or homeless families that might be living on public assistance or service level jobs making $8 an hour. So uh, a city, the city is a very them. complex uh, uh, equation to deal with and there are a lot of different aspects to it. We were just trying to hit on one, which was the housing opportunities that come off it. I had a hand in the back there. Uh, so I lived in Northampton for a little more than 20 years. Um, I'm a former chair of the Housing Partnership, um, and done some other stuff, so I have pretty good familiarity with housing in Northampton. And it's certainly my impression, and Mary mentioned something a minute ago, um, that one of the trends that we've had uh, is for apartment units uh, to be turned into home ownership units, in other words, condos. So uh, I agree completely uh, with, the, with the notion um, that there's a demand for rental housing. Um, but I'm quite skeptical um, as to whether there are developers who want to build rental housing as opposed to home ownership housing. I wonder if anybody could comment on that. I, I will tell you that in most of the markets we deal with now, the, the greatest interest is in rental housing, not, not for sale housing, for a variety of reasons. The ability to acquire funding being the biggest one. But there is sort of statewide, if not nationally, still pretty significant amount of concern about the ability to build new <coughs> for sale housing and there is a pretty large pipeline of stuff from the last housing crisis that's still out there that has to be filtered through. But overall there's, our, yeah, there's a lot of developers that are very interested in developing rental housing. There's an uh, uh, economic structural thing going on in this country right now, especially in the South, and that is the cap rates on the, uh, the housing 
uh, ownership of housing, the developers of those that kind of housing product uh, are cashing out. The cap rates are down around five and five and a half percent, and they're finding out that the markets are getting thinner because there's more competition. So you're going to see this avalanche of cash out across uh, a broad swath of from Florida over to Texas uh, fairly soon, and that cash is eyeballing this part of the country, and especially in student housing because. There is no student housing, private student housing in New England. It doesn't exist. Every place else, it's really, I mean, student housing is the hottest market. Private student housing is the hottest market in the country today, right now. So they're trying to position their cash to get out of something where they're getting the best cap rate, the best way to cash out, and get into another uh, product, a real estate product that's out there. So I think that, uh, and, and like Massachusetts, you can't do public-private partnership with UMass. Impossible. You can't build housing for UMass. Unless you go through a five-year process to lease the property, and then the chances of doing that are probably not going to happen. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is that um, here again, it's a trend in building single-family houses or building uh, condos is going like that. And it's, it's just like somebody was asking about businesses in the downtown. Well, I remember when Amherst used to have three hardware stores and three um, drug stores. CVS and no hardware stores. I mean, we got Lowe's and we got the Home Depot, and that's, that's pretty much it. So things have a life cycle. They, they, we may not want to see them go, but they do come and go. But I guarantee you, on the, on the, uh, on the financing front, you're going to see an amassing of cash out there floating from the south to the east. And so we need to find out a way to do it. So as I say this, I'm thinking that developers know this, and so that they're going to be looking for product, and they're going to be looking for the prime markets for that product. And I know what they're looking for now is they're looking for downtown infill projects. So chances are that you're going to start getting some interest if you can start getting your marketing piece in place to get out there and attract it, because every other community in the Northeast is doing the same thing you're doing. They're trying to put a, a marketing package together that they can get out to the private sector and say, hey, look. We're better than uh, Westfield, you know, so on and so forth. So that's what it's coming down to is competition amongst towns that have the same quality of life that Northampton has right now. And you gotta get you gotta have to market yourself. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. And there are actually companies that, that charge a lot of money to brand communities and define them for themselves. We're after six o'clock right now. I'll take one more question if it's a short one. It's quite short. <laughs> but it may be a long answer. That's your fault. Um, <laughs> there are three opportunities presented to you, and in your time spent wandering Northampton, do you see a fourth or fifth? See plenty of opportunities in, in, in town. And it, but specific ones? I don't know. Did you? Did, uh, I, I, you know, the Jack August site always Jack thought August was site. great, you know, and it's totally underutilized. I know the How much? Was, say again? How much? Uh, let's see. What's the size of the property? I'll tell you. <laughs> no, but it is. It, as far as I'm concerned, it's it's. You got a parking lot there. Uh, you have the potential for doing a six, seven story building. Uh, you have the potential for doing mixed use. Uh, you have the potential for uh, combining kinds of uses, all the way from a boutique hotel to downtown residential to restaurants to uh, brew pubs. Uh, you name it. It's it's got the potential for being this kind of like beacon right there on the corner. So there are, are people who've been looking, and, and things do could happen other than, than the, the three that's shown. Um, Wayne, do you want to have? Just that one quick thing that goes to Peter's comment, I think Eric Ford's comment. Um, you know, we see a lot of sites around town. So these three sites we chose were really, frankly, sexy projects to get people excited. But they're certainly by no means the only projects to have there. So we think there's a lot of opportunities for projects. Um, you see a lot of interest in various things. Some of the trends you guys talked about are true. So that you know the the rental piece at um, Rounds Hill, for example, the, the new is a luxury housing, new luxury housing, our rental, um, the project Mary Ford asked for about um, Hampton Gardens, Hampton uh, Gardens, no, Hampton Court, sorry, um, we renewed that, and, and the, the owner of the property wasn't just in the vacant condos; they were half of the rental. I thought that made sense. For well, I want to thank you all very much for listening to us. I hope we were helpful. Uh, let you know that uh, 
that this is not the end of the, of the process in, in terms of, of the meeting. Uh, Peg, do you want to fill in? But thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So Peter's question was a great segue into the November 4th session, because that's when we're going to get our just local folks and down and dirty and see what's around and see if we can mix and match, get some things going. So thank you so much again for coming. Big round of applause one more time for our And please be very careful going home. And I need the housing partnership back in the bistro. We have a short business meeting. And we're in the back room, even if coppers won't go there, but we're going to be in the back room and uh, make some things happen. So thank you all so much again.